Hello and welcome, uh, everybody on the internet, which is a whole lot of people. Yeah, it's a ton of these people days. on the internet. Yeah, ton, probably several thousand tons. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting that on the internet you can't get a public address like you could in public. You know, you can't just go out. There's no public in the internet. There's you no get a public IP like, address. Everyone, listen. Everyone who's in earshot, listen to me. Everyone <laughs> right. has to choose to pay attention to you on the internet. Yeah. The, the, the poor, like, na naysayers and uh, future uh, tellers, fortune tellers who used to run the streets and just scream about how the world was going to end, like, they can't really do that these days. They're just yeah. ignored on message bulletin boards. Well, I guess they could get your challenge. email and they can spam you. So there's that. When I get spam, it never tells me about the end of the world. It's always trying no. to convince me the world won't end. <laughs> yeah, and so. the, that I need to buy something. Spam. Extra printer <laughs> cartridges or something. Isn't spam all about just selling you spam? Like, actually canned I've never fake had me. spam about spam. No? Never receive spam. That's ridiculous spam. that that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, could be a whole uh, campaign for them. We're gonna, we should write to them, I think. That was on our list to do. They're to probably start watching. writing to companies. They know already. Yeah. It's well, the internet, you know? they're going to be at our door. They're going to be buzzing <laughs> on the door. I'm like, we're the spam people. <laughs> like, yeah. Which spam people, man? You send us fucking emails all the time? Or? Hormel, I think. Yeah? They make Is that that's the company that makes it? Yeah. yeah. What else do they make? They make chili, too, right? No idea. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we've f we're fucking editing this there shit right now. We've turned it into a fucking corporate commercial already. Yeah, I hate spam and chili, unless it's really good vegetarian chili with sour cream. And so it was Halloween recently too, right? It was. Yeah, we're on episode twenty now. It's been twenty weeks, right? Nineteen plus a day. Nineteen in a day, and uh, yeah, Halloween night was good. We played a show at Mama Joy's and uh, didn't really take part in Halloween at all. Saw no. lots of great uh, photos of people dressed up and everything. I think okay. costuming is just one part of Halloween. Mm -hmm. uh, acting a little out of sorts, that's another part of Halloween. Yeah. Everybody did that. Well, I want to get classic and traditional and like celebrate Sam Hain. I've always wanted to do that. Who is Sam Hain? Well, it's like the Celtic tradition that Halloween sort of comes from after the church co opted it and turned it All Saints Day. Mm -hmm. You know, Pagan Holiday, it's Harvest Festival, basically. It comes from a Harvest Festival. Yeah, that makes sense. And part of it was, uh, there were two things I learned about it, and one of them was, you know, bringing the cows down from the mountain because it's time for winter, mm -hmm. and then getting drunk after that, apparently. Um, and they also did this thing... Uh, so would they wear costumes for that? Did costumes come out of that tradition or something else? I did read something about that, but they would make ornamentation that somehow later was bastardized into, like, a pumpkin head. Or evolved um, into, whatever, man. Yeah. It's, I, I don't know about <laughs> evolution, so... But I know about bastards, so... That's <laughs> And um, the other thing they did is they would put out their hearth. Every, like, local home and cottage would put out their hearth, and then they would go to uh, the center of town. They'd build a huge bonfire, and then everybody would take a stick or whatever, and they would get that fire and take it back to their hearth so that it was kind of this, like, harvest festival slash, like, sharing Blending the communal the fire. Yeah. And, like, all, all the harvests were going to be cooking winter. all winter. Yeah. Our ovens are heaters. Going to be cooking spam and chili all winter. And, you know, so... There's a lot of that during those pagan harvest festivals yeah right? but how cool is that if we still celebrated something like that in a communal way you know but uh i guess we do right we go get candy did. i haven't gotten candy in years i got candy the morning of halloween really i was picking up my breakfast sandwich and i got uh, i had put out a bowl for it he's like happy halloween whoa candy in a breakfast sandwich like a bacon egg and cheese with chocolate on it with the twix yeah well not on it <laughs> I just Twix and a bacon, egg, and cheese, man. Breakfast dessert. You're yeah. bringing up some deep philosophical stuff <laughs> right now, actually. We're going to have to have a long conversation later. Yeah. So, um, yeah, anyway, uh, episode 20. Um, we've got a really cool lineup tonight, right? Yeah. I'm really we excited about tonight's show. The door right now. Yeah, we've got guests arriving at right now as we speak. Yeah. Um, but uh, tonight's going to be really great. We have uh, musician Scott Rudd. Uh, he's mm -hmm. a really great songwriter, and he pl he's played uh, at Mama Joy's uh, recently at one of the shows that we've had there. Yeah. Yeah, I saw I saw him at another show a while back. I realized it last night. Oh, cool. I, I hadn't known his name before. I, I realized I that know. last night, too, yeah. And also, there's a, a little framed image. He has these cards. You've seen his card? Yeah. It's got this guy on it. It's like, you're like, is that Scott Rudd? And it throws you off, but then you realize it's like an older picture. Yeah. But there's one framed in Mama Joy's. Like, there's one hidden in just a nice little place. It's like an Easter egg hidden inside the bar. I saw it last night. And, um, yeah, who else we got? We got uh, Lisa Rivera. We do. The artist Lisa Rivera, she's a really great um, photographer with a really great history, and um, she's going to share her uh, new and current work with us tonight, and hopefully some past stuff too. Um, so that's really exciting. Uh, big fan of Lisa's work. Um, and we also have Emmanuel Iduma. Uh, Emmanuel is a friend of the Sulfur Bath, and also we met through Sean Randall at the Mantle. And he's been on the show before. He's been on the show before. Previous guest, uh, really great segment. Uh, Emmanuel is a writer. 
Um, and uh, recently, uh, he did some experimental fiction called Farad, mm -hmm. and um, I we got uh, a lesson in that uh, on that segment. And just now, him and Sean Randall at the Mantle are editing their first editing and publishing their first book of collected uh, fiction. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're going to talk about that and get the scoop on that. And I think that's really awesome. So. Um, yeah. So we better get to it. Yeah, we better we get to it. We have a lot to do today. So tonight we're going to start with a musical performance, and um, I think this is going to be really great. We're going to have Scott Rudd on, um, friend of the Sulphur Bath. We're going to talk to him afterwards first, but uh, we would uh, it's our great honor to introduce Scott Rudd. Did you Give say afterwards sec. first? Afterwards first. first, we're going to... Wait, what? You what said afterwards say? first. Anyways. First of words. <laughs> Thank you. 
leaving I'm lying in my bed Well, I'm not forgiven You're playing with my heart And my heart stopped living
show me where it was you'd grown And told me things I'd like to know Oh, what a shame, a shame, a shame Two different worlds Should I do any more? Is that good or? Okay. Give me one sec. trees and when I put in a box got on my knees with a song you're writing to me and you got nothing to say when I gave you my heart you gave me notice to vacate I'm gone to say when I gave you my heart you gave me notice to vacate I'm gone now I'm gone I'm Got on my knees, was I wrong? Was I wrong? Yeah, I was wrong. Yeah. Screwed that one up. Okay. I'll do one more, is that right? And then I'll be done. Yeah, one more. Okay. Oh, I'm 
probably right Yeah, you probably lied Something's changed You're acting strange You're acting strange I'm caught Up inside I'm probably right Probably lied Uh, yes, yeah, good. Yeah, Scott Rudd, thanks, man. That was really great. Yeah, thank you. Really great, man. Um, hearing you in, uh, it, there's a juxtaposition between hearing you here in the studio and over at Mama Joy's, you know, there's such a different setting in the environment, you know, when you're sitting there. But, um, yeah, that's really touching, man. Really uh, great thanks. stuff. Yeah. Thanks. Um, where does that come from? <laughs> in my, uh, so ambiguous way of asking, you know. It's not very uh, ambiguous. It's pretty straightforward. <laughs> a misery, I guess. No, I don't know. There you uh, go. <laughs> heart, heart, heartache, things like that. You know. Um, how, how long have you been playing? Uh... I played guitar since I was 14, but I never really took it that seriously. So I, I started like playing out and doing songs in 2009, I guess, mm -hmm. so four years ago. Yeah. So. Yeah. And do you, are you always just doing the solo uh, act, or you do other arrangements? Uh, or usually, what else yeah, usually solo. In the recordings, there's some um, some pretty you know sparse accompaniment, but uh, mm -hmm. I'm not the best uh, jamming musician, so I usually just play solo yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah and what kind of recordings is that some stuff that uh, we can all go here online or yeah, something yeah yeah you can go to uh it's a scottrudmusic.com and you can hear there's a I have an album and an ep and some like singles singles as, as well mm -hmm. that are hopefully going to be on the next the next album which i need to start doing mm -hmm. sooner than later yeah so it's are, are you recording in studio are you doing your own recordings or how do you uh do half and half uh I use a four-track um, reel-to-reel -reel and cassette. Um, I have a friend who has the reel-to-reel. -reel. I have the cassette. So the first album I did was was half on each, four four songs on each um, medium, and then um, then I did another like an EP called Demos, which was pretty much all done by myself. Uh, 
with the four track or some stuff on the computer too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I I, uh, I don't know. I like like tinkering around with that stuff, but mm -hmm. looking to record some more. I need need some uh, some help with uh, some accompaniment. If anyone out there plays the cello or uh, drums, come talk to me. There you go. Yeah, it's a shout out to that. Yeah, man, we'll find a cello <laughs> player for you. Yes, that please. Your stuff sounds amazing with cello. Just yeah. Hit, hit me, right as you say. Yeah, some of the stuff, on some of the earlier recordings have cello on them, and um, yeah, I just need someone to help me out with that. So. That sounds great. Yeah. Do you always play with the same guitar, that classical style? or? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, not for always. Not al since always, but uh, I, I got that guitar maybe three years ago. Uh, I was about to play my first show and uh, I was at a friend's practicing on, I had a steel string guitar and I picked up that guitar and I really liked it and they said I could use it and um, I've never given it back. Mm -hmm. So hold on to your instruments. <laughs> <laughs> You've got this uh, notch on the guitar when yeah. you strummed it so much. I think that's yeah, that, that wasn't on there when I got it so I definitely am responsible for that. <laughs> yeah. I claimed it for yourself. <laughs> yeah, I've marked it. <laughs> Do you have any uh, shows coming up that we can see live again? So? Uh, no, not right now. I just played a couple. I haven't got any booked mm -hmm. right now. Um, been working a lot, so I haven't, yeah, haven't had good. a chance to... Well, if you do, let us know. We'll put it on the archive and everything. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for out. having me play. Really, can you tell us, uh, was all the content you played tonight like from a specific album, a specific period that you made it? Or? Um, let me think what I played. Um... Most of it was on the de the EP I did called Demos. Um, is that the most recent? Yeah, there's a c there's the last song I played uh, is is after that, which is hopefully going to be on the next the next one. But yeah, mm -hmm. it was yeah, I guess the, mo the most recent one I guess, um, which was from last year. Um, and uh, yeah, just. You were asking what the songs are about? I forget what you said. Sorry. Yeah, I was I, I was leading into oh, that. Okay. I guess. Well, but yeah, I'm very curious. Uh, I love the style well, that you're singing. Uh, well, um, I uh, had a, a pretty difficult relationship with someone uh, I met when I was traveling. I met this girl in Spain. And uh, I, unfortunately, I, I fell in love, which was a mistake. And then uh, it was pretty pretty hard with the long distance. And I'd go back and forth to Barcelona and back quite a lot, well, not that long, but we went back and forth a few times and, um, yeah, it didn't really work out. So a lot of those songs are about that, I guess. Mm. Yeah. So, but now I've got to think of something else to write about. Mm. Well, there's this strange link I'm hearing too, when you tell the story about it too, with the, um, the nylon string guitar in Spain, you know, that mm -hmm. in my, some short travels, I've been lucky enough to go to Spain and I've had that experience like seeing the guys on the street playing flamenco style and using and the texture you get from nylon instead of string, you know, and so there's a, I don't know, yeah. some sort of link there that, that it fits so perfectly. Yeah, it seems to where I wasn't, I mean, I wasn't thinking about that, but I, like, it wasn't a choice to do it for that reason, but, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I totally get the link. I, mm -hmm. I like the, the tones and the sounds of the flamenco style or whatever, the Spanish guitar. Have so. you traveled a lot playing music at all? Yeah, a little bit. I did, that's, I was doing a tour when I went there. Um, I went to... Uh, Germany and uh, England, Spain, and France in 2011, I think. And then I went back, then I met this person, then I went back again, and then I went back again. Um, and then I did a, a tour of the UK last year, and I would say to your viewers out there, don't waste your time going to that shithole of a country. <laughs> <laughs> it, so you weren't received no, well or <laughs> no it it was just it there's no sunshine i was oh, there I for see, five yeah. weeks in their summer mm -hmm. and there was absolutely no sunshine it's mm -hmm. miserable and, and uh now i'm look like a total asshole but whatever it, it was just i call it the sinkhole i call <laughs> especially london i call it the sinkhole it's just like expensive congested crowded and mm -hmm. just miserable but anyway that's sounds like here <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Some people love it. I don't know. I don't. I don't understand the whole London thing. I mean, if you want to see pasty people with bad teeth and spray tans and 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 just shit congestion, I mean, maybe you'll like it. But mm -hmm. do I sound bitter about that? I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> 
And there's also that Bill Withers reference, uh, Ain't No Sunshine When She's Gone. There you go. That's, yeah. that's, that Ain't was, no in, sunshine. was in between the lines there. Somewhere. I mean, I get it why they conquered the world back in the day. They had to get the fuck <laughs> out of their, their <laughs> island. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but actually was received very well there, to be mm-hmm. honest. I sh- sound like a mm-hmm. dick, but that, that, that was actually one of the best... Uh, Audiences was there, but I just Wh- don't like that country. Anymore. Where did you play? Did you play in London? Or? Yeah, uh, London, and then uh, up in the north, uh, northeast and west, and then Scotland, which was great. Mm-hmm. S- Scotland's a different country. It's cool. Yeah, it's um, cool. Wh- where did you go in Scotland? Uh, I played the Isle of Egg, which is an island off the what's it? Uh, west coast. It was a uh, Fence Records uh, festival, and that was awesome. That was really fun. Um, Sounds cool. That was definitely one of the highlights. Um, I really enjoyed Scotland quite a lot, but uh, Germany and Germany's probably the best place I think to play in terms of crowds and and whatnot. Um, hmm. You know, we're still we're still talking very small crowds. You know, mm-hmm. no one knows who I makes if they throw stuff at me. That's about it. Mm-hmm. In yeah. Germany, they throw stuff. The feces. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. They they're into. And that's why it's better. Yes. <laughs> 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 it's the exhilaration. My family people. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be challenged when you're on the road. So. Yeah, you know, sometimes you're into that, sometimes you're not. Mm-hmm. Well, that's really cool. You got any uh, other plans for touring around anytime soon? Uh, right burner stuff? Yeah, right now, I'm thinking of maybe going to Portugal in January. Maybe. Uh, I've never been there. I would like to go there. I haven't been there either. I've uh, I saw some pictures recently because um, actually Lisa, who's uh, going to do a segment on tonight's show, her and Les mm-hmm. just got married and they did their uh, honeymoon in uh, Portugal. Oh, so you can tell me about and it then. I s- they had all these pictures. Uh, <laughs> this is weird. I'm talking about the other guests. Why they're not here? Um, they're here. <coughs> no, they're over there. Well, I mean here. <laughs> <laughs> Edit button. Bing. <laughs> um, is it nice? Yeah. I those pictures that they shared were amazing, yeah. and I was like, Sunshine. I really want to go. Lisbon. Yeah. Good. Okay. Is there sunshine there? Yeah, good. Okay, so it's better than England, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Hundred I mean foot waves in Portugal, like from storms, or is that like a recurring thing, like in Australia? Well, I do spend a lot of time thinking about waves, so I think I'm gonna like it a lot. Cool. Over there. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, well, I, I wish you the best of luck and Thank stuff you, for, yeah. you know, traveling and mm-hmm. more recording. We want to hear more. And um, like I said, when we put the archive up, if anything new pops up, let us know so we can update everybody. Yeah, thanks know. for inviting me on the show. Of course, man. Really yeah. awesome Thanks. performance, dude. Thanks. Our pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for cool. having me. Okay. Scott Rudd. Everybody go check out Scott Rudd's music. What's the webpage again, Scott? Uh, it's just my name. S-C-O-T-T? Yeah. R-U-D-D? Yeah. Dot com. Oh, music.com. Scott Rudd music.com. Yeah, check it out. Thanks again. put it down He's got the scottrudd.com. <laughs> so if you happen to be you. looking for an apartment and some amazing music from a great songwriter. One name to remember. Yeah. Scott Rudd. Remember. Yeah, <laughs> very cool, Scott. That was awesome. Yeah, good. Uh, that sounded great coming yeah. to the system. The, just the blend. The mics were just right. And I hope everybody at home heard it how we heard it. That was awesome. Yeah. Thanks again, Scott. Very definitely cool. Was, it definitely was very enjoyable here. Yeah. And I, have, I feel really good the about the range of the musical time. performances we have here too, right? Like, yeah. Um, we got it. We've talked about this in the past too, and and we also talked about how we talk about the show too much on the show. Yeah, and we also but talk about how <laughs> we talk about how. We yeah, and how many? And we we talk about how many episodes there's been way too much. Like every show begins like, so what yeah. episode is it now? And you know, there's just like a whole list of episodes. We didn't right do in that front. this week though. We we breeze right past it, that, and I don't mm, think we should make that mentioned. mistake right now. Yeah, it was mentioned. Uh, it's too late. I mean, but you put it's the elephant in the room now, so you keep going with it for a second. And then it becomes mildly normal before you move on. Yeah, but on. you know, we have to get onto other guests so we can just go there. Right, this is the segue. Yeah. yeah. S- somehow. Right, we need a good segue. So <clears throat> we're ready for uh, another guest segment. So uh, I'm a big fan of uh, everybody that's on the show tonight, actually, and Lissa's uh, artwork is amazing. So really pleased to share um, Lissa Rivera's artwork. Lissa, please yeah. come join us on the show. Yeah. Joining us, how are you? You're welcome. I'm good. Yeah. How are you? You're really good. Um, episode 20, you know how many shows we've done now? <laughs> um, but I'm so pleased. 20 is kind of a big round number for me, and when you said that you'd do the show, I was really pleased that it would be this one. It's, um, um, I would want to be on the 21st. Can I come back next Yeah, week? And next week, <laughs> Lissa <laughs> Rivera, 20, episode 21, which would have meant that we've been going for 21 episodes. So um, I'm done with that. Anyway, um, yeah, quite an honor to have you here. Thanks for uh, coming on the show. So um, what's going on? You're going to share some of your work with us, and we have a lot of slides to share with everybody at home, um, and we'd like to talk to you about that. But just real quick, can I ask what's been going on recently? With my art? Um, so I 
maybe I'll get to that. I put everything in chronological order. Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe, so the image up right now is just kind of, like if you want to breeze through some of the first images. Cool. Um, it's from this set of interiors that I work, it's a project I worked on for like like five years mm-hmm. where I, yeah, so the first one is a part of this series that was done in private schools. And uh, so this is a private high school in Boston. And I was, um, what I was doing was trying to archive as many interiors of schools as possible. I was really fascinated with how um, with how these institutional spaces like affected the students, and um, but I only I was only focused on the structure, and I was really looking for different elements within the room that kind of um, that I thought could possibly like af- affect the identity, like maybe like a sense of privilege or a sense of a lack of trust, or you know just like how. N- how nice it was, like how much freedom there was inside the space or like the type of history that would be like imbued upon like the students, like through, you know, having like antiques or carpets or beautiful things to make you feel as if you're part of like a legacy. So this is like a, Mm. so this is a auditorium. This is a cafeteria and the next is a library in the same school. So the next one. Wow, that's great. There's a, yeah, the yeah, that's the cafeteria. But the next image, yeah, that's a part, a small portion of a library at Roxbury Academy. And I also, so what I did was I did private high schools, public high schools. I did um, colleges, like community colleges. This I did fraternity houses. So this is a fraternity house at Northeast Academy, and there are quite a few um, like images of the people who were part of that club before. This is a Boston University fraternity house, and you can see how they kind of have an old brownstone mansion, but then they have, um, yeah, the blue one. So which image oh, sorry, is on? Is on? Right is okay, so yeah. the right one's live. So, so this image is kind of like stadium style seating. That's really crappy couches and stuff, but they're oh, wow. they're like eighteen year old boys like <laughs> living in this mansion, and they have maids and cooks and everything. And really, um, like the next one, uh, this one isn't quite as nice. It's at a state school, and there it was like the morning after a party. Wow, look at the juxtaposition. And but I'm just really interested how. Um, you know, what this meant to be, like, in this club for these different groups of people and, um, like, how they used the space, like, how they used, you know, the privilege of being in this space. And, like, the next one is, um, like, a pool. This is a MIT fraternity. And, um, like, they're, it's, it's very beautiful, but then there are, like, there's a lot of graffiti that's quite um, offensive on the wall. And then there, you know, and then there's things that you can't avoid, like a fire extinguisher, right. you know, things like that thrown in. I was really like looking for as many like signifiers as possible to like include within the space and also like using it as an opportunity because I went to like, you know, 40 or 50 different institutions by the end and just kind of finding a way to like get permission to like experience all these spaces on my own and like for the fraternity houses a lot of times I I'd have to like knock on their door and they would just let me in and I'd be like I'm gonna do a project and then they'd be like okay and I get to wander into like all of their bedrooms and get to kind of like hang out or like I would take the commuter rail to like a you know a beautiful campus of a private high school like boarding school and they would just allow me because I have a camera I would just be allowed to wander around go into offices like you know wander through hallways on my own and just wait till everyone left to kind of like explore that's great it's like infiltration yeah like kind of I'm kind of voyeuristic I like (laughs) well if you let me into your house watch out um but uh the next uh one let's see this this orange one here. 
Yeah, this is a community college. I just think it's really funny how the chairs are bolted into the wall at the end of the hallway there. And this is, um, you know, where you would have class and you get to stare at that. I just, this is some, a, a lot of it, I just think it's really funny. Like, I think this is really funny how the planters in, indoors this way with these really bizarre looking like scraggly trees so it's the next one just yeah what what is it we're looking at there. that's in a library but then there's like this this giant teal planter that they thought would maybe make the space better um <laughs> it's so awkward though right and it's think. kind of like it's, hiding it's right in the way yeah it's kind of hiding the offices but it's in the library of a community college and i always like how absurd some of these things are even in the in the spaces you'd consider more beautiful. I liked finding like kind of absurd juxtapositions of how they handled the space, like making it seem like domestic and comfortable. But really, it's a place where you just want, you know, you're just kind of like pushing like hundreds of students through constantly every year. Mm -hmm. Like the are we looking at we're looking On at the, the yellow right. one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's a cafeteria, and I just think it looks like. You know, a place for prisoners. Yeah, so bland. And or something life. like that. Yeah. yeah, it's just, you know, maybe you don't notice it because you're more interested in, like, the social, more interested in as a social space if you're going to school there. But, like, when you kind of, like, look at it, I think it's really funny. And the next one. So the next one is really where I started. It's um, public high schools. So that's, like, a a public high school that's more like a occupational training high school. I mm. got into it, like, for the public, it was more like semi-public, like charter schools, but they were more, they weren't necessarily for privileged children. I mean, just like in Boston, it's mostly, um, it's mostly like charter schools. That also that looks like a prison to me, too, yeah, right? Like the block. Like. And the next one, yeah, that's a cafeteria with, like, 1970s posters of <laughs> yoga, like, oh, cool. up on the wall mm -hmm. and then the next one um that's the bath that's the ladies room and the next one is uh in downtown boston where it's like really beautiful i feel like this might have been in beacon street or something it's a very like upper class area but then the school there the public school there was just like a mess inside <laughs> i mean like the teachers might be really good but the space was kind of sad mm -hmm. that's the hall work wall of fame behind the leaking pipe <laughs> and i love how you, you're giving so much character to the space itself without a traditional subject right but it, it you know so it becomes the subject yeah I'm or do you think of it like it's it's the lack of a subject and there's a secret that you wouldn't notice when there's a bunch of people standing in the room that suddenly you get to see you know what I mean? Yeah, I was really interested in the environment more, and I'm really interested in inanimate objects and how they're used to construct identity. So I, um, I didn't really want anyone around because I didn't want there to be like a, a personal connection to the students per se, but I wanted it to create like a stage where you could imagine yourself within the, the space. And so I kind of kept my camera at a similar level. Mm. Like that's cool. Yeah, that's kind of how I feel as I'm things. looking through them. Like you're putting me in that environment and then the emotional triggers that happen in that environment can play out to me without interference from like, what am I doing there or, or who am I here with or something? Yeah, I wasn't really interested in the students themselves. Mm -hmm. The compositions are all really amazing too. There's really great colors and everything. Thanks. Love it. What, what uh, medium is this that we're looking at? What, what, is this all digital? No, this was before, you know, digital was really good, so okay. it's all on film. I mean, t yeah, that's all film, medium format. And do you want to uh, set up this next series for us? Yeah, the next series is really different. <laughs> so um, in this series, I was, I'm always interested in how people use um, inanimate objects or even use, like, images to create their identity, and I was really interested. I was really interested in like how people were using archives. Like I consider like Facebook or MySpace like kind of like 
archives that people created themselves. Mm -hmm. And I really became interested in how the more people thought that they were um, in control of their identity, the more you can see where they were trying. Mm -hmm. Like the more you try, like the more it just looks like like what you're trying to do Mm -hmm. instead Mm -hmm. of it being very natural. And just people kind of like learning Photoshop to be able to edit their own bodies and kind of looking at how bodies themselves have been changing because of technology and because of people using photography so much. Like I feel like, um, I don't know, I just feel like there's been a shift. So uh, I kind of, what I did was I took a break from this kind of like obsessive archiving I was doing of all these schools and I just I don't know I don't really talk about this project project very much but I just started taking like thousands and thousands and thousands of images of myself and kind of like combining them into new bodies just based on like experimenting Mm. like with all of the images and experimenting with like how I felt like with manipulating myself through photography so I just um, I was really interested in, like, you know, influenced by, like, Hans Belmer, of course, and I, I created, like, kind of, like, a stage, like, setting again by just, but it's a lot more minimal, and I just try to create different characters, and I did, like, a big series of these, but um, maybe I have to figure out what to do with all the thousands of images I took. This uh, is su- kind of super, interesting super too. interesting to me. I mean, this is really arresting. And it, there's something to it that I, 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 it's not shocking. But there's something scary or just unnatural. It's like so. It's supernatural, right? Or I mean, would you describe it that way? That's my. That's I, I see these, and there's something that's really arrests me. The first time I saw one of these was up at um, your guys' place, and it was on the wall, and I was like, "What is this image? It's hanging on the wall here. It's amazing." Yeah, the, I want. You know, I feel like, like I wanted to. Like sometimes I feel like. It can almost be like very disturbing. Like when you see, like, you know, you do a Google image search and you realize like an image is like on this page that's like this person's like obsession with some like celebrity and there's like thousands and thousands and thousands of images. Or sometimes there'll be like a collection of of images of all different types of celebrities that mm-hmm. like one person puts together. Mm-hmm. And then it's like you see this like mute, they're mutating, like their, their brains, like idealism is like mutating through all of these images. Like in the way you even like look at yourself, like mutates. I feel like even like when I just got married and just like wedding planning, I feel like, um, like just because of, like, the amount of, like, Pinterest and all these big image galleries and stuff like that, that you just begin to dissociate from your own self and you just start to associate with all these these big archives of images that are not you at all and they're they're constantly shifting with your mood or shifting with what your ideal would be of yourself. And I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes (laughs) a lot of sense. You're bringing up, like, a very interesting issue that our society is kind of confronted with now right or like not the whole society but like some people they just let go in that and then when do you lose your sense of a natural self you said natural earlier and you're just kind of going through a deck of cards deciding what's going to look coolest or whatever i don't know and then uh, you know with all the technology that plays out and you know like you're talking about pinterest i haven't used a lot of those but even my experiences with facebook i i totally get what you're saying and it's I don't know. The way that y- that you're using your images and your artwork to express that is it just knocks me down on the ground. This this next one that Miho's about to show is I think uh really amazing. The the, the sense of like losing part of the body or something. This is what I I really wanted to ask you about this series and and get your take on it and get you to express it. So because it to me it's arresting and I'm like, oh, "What is it?" you know. Um uh, I mean this one I I think I was just experimenting with you know what I could do with with the images of the bodies like a lot of times I would just take different parts of my skin and put them over like another part to create like a new interesting form Mm -hmm. or this one I just like deleted you know that part of my my 
where my legs were. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think a lot of even like if you think of like image archives on the Internet, even like pornography is like a huge archive. And I feel like a lot of pornography like you like bodies are just reduced down to like basic parts. Mm -hmm. And it's not really about like like an identity at all. You just start identifying with these like um, body parts that keep being reduced down to like more basic levels and it's not really necessarily like I'm like supporting it or opposing it I'm just kind of observing it and seeing like how it could be really amazing to have access to all of these things but really frightening and out, like mm -hmm. out of control at the same time mm -hmm. and in your sense talking about how that can influence one's self one's persona but on a, a whole social level of these like we're all becoming these archives that we're creating um so maybe the next project i'll talk about really quickly um so i really became interested in all the um, images i was looking at online and i and kind of how you can mistakenly open up like Pandora's box and find like this genre of like archive like this arc like this genre I don't know I just keep using the word archive a lot but like you can find like a genre of people who are doing like performing these certain kinds of behaviors and I really became like I, I happened upon like this group of people who have this fetish that could be on YouTube I mean, I actually found it when I was, like, looking up, like, a clip from John Waters' Female Trouble or something. Mm -hmm. And then, like, you know, you kind of, like, can spiral out of control on the Internet. And, like, on the side, there's suggested video. And there's, like, this person wearing, like, a female mask, which is different than cross-dressing. It's where people wear, like, these really kind of crude masks or some of them are more realistic where they look like – I should have put some pictures in here of that. But – um where they look like more like dolls and I was really interested but they don't really do much they don't really talk much they just kind of look like an inanimate object and then there I found this crazy website with thousands and thousands of images called the doll album and it's people who have real dolls which are like these really um high-tech sex dolls mm -hmm. and they um they take tons of pictures on a daily basis of of their doll and their evolving relationship with their doll. And some people take them on vacations. Some people, you know, have meetups or they make dinner for them or they go camping with them. Um, so I just was so obsessed with it. And I just kept collecting all of these images. And I created a an office of like a 19th century um but maybe if you go back to the first one, like you'd see it better. But um, it was kind of like an office of a 19th century like sex researcher. It's kind of like Freud's office or something like that. And I framed everything in wood, and I I um, added in all these books about like eugenics and you know all these possible references about like sexuality and and kind of like the turn of the last century where people were. Um, kind of like really interested in using technology on the body right away to gain control over their body like I feel like the other like the other like a lot of these images are like trying to gain control over the identities of, of like groups of people large groups of people through imagery or through objects like inanimate objects so I was really um looking at that and kind of looking at how these things like affected the culture at that time. So like with German romanticism or, you know, all these kind of stories like Frankenstein or um, Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, there's like, you know, countless stories that I feel like are directly influenced by like kind of like the lure and also the fear of that technology. And I feel like we're at that point now where we kind of remember like a time before the internet's prevalency and we see what's happening after so kind of like being on the cusp of those of that perspective so kind of like I created this space and you could go into it I installed it in a few places and you could go into it and you could kind of like look through these albums and I have the videos displayed and you can kind of you know I, I took them out of the space of the internet and kind of like made it so you could sit 
with them longer because I feel like, you know, those things are very ephemeral online and can be taken down. So I kind of like downloaded like hundreds of videos and images and stuff. And I create, I, I kept all of, you know, how many views they had and like some of the comments and, you know, I kept a lot of the information with them. So I kind of was like giving them more importance than maybe taking them beyond being like pornography or being some kind of like, um, I don't know, expression of like a desired identity for these people. So I, that was something I did, like creating space. And I just really became so interested in the 19th century. And I started working with archives as a profession more, like, you know, working with collections and collecting myself um, and looking back through the history of photography. So the next image is from... Uh, well, the one that's on right now with the bell jar, that's like a little video inside of there. Yeah, you had the little LCDs. Yeah, there's like a video. little video in there, and it's inside of bell jar. But this one is just showing, I'm just showing right away how I made the photos. So um, this is really just an example of how I made them. But I was really interested in studio photography, like at the turn of the century, because at the time people really couldn't. People rarely took the camera outside, you know, if they're going to take a, a portrait, maybe for, you know, they're kind of the rarer image if you get like a, a photo taken outdoors. And it's usually like of a, of a store or of like a horse you just bought or of your farm or mm-hmm. something. Um, so like p- studio portraiture was really like indoors. And is, um, sorry to interrupt. Is that because you're saying because just the setup and it's so much bigger and it's harder, or it's just it's well, yeah. I mean, like it was harder, mm-hmm. <laughs> and cameras were different, and like there wasn't like roll film, there weren't snapshots, mm-hmm. and um, I think by the time you know cabinet, this is a cabinet photo, which is like a photo mounted on car. You probably see them in antique shops for like three bucks or something. Mm-hmm. And I was, I'm just really interested in all the props surrounding them, like, because it could be someone from a, you know, working class background, but then they have these studio props that make it, you know, painted backdrops that make it look as if they're in a mansion <laughs> or, you know, like a very nicely upholstered chair, but everyone kind of shares it, but they're trying to kind of display, like, he's got like a book, so he's trying to display like a level of you know education or intellect and or maybe a certain class you know elevating himself to a certain class beyond you know his present you know economic state so that's just kind of an image showing before I photoshop the person out and then I, the next one is kind of just what the image looked like in in the end so this is a, a studio backdrop but I got rid of the person so you can kind of just see like the ideal space that they selected Mm. to be photographed within and these I um just project as if it would be the size of the backdrop and there aren't that many images of these backdrops like there's not many that remained like they're painted over or like didn't Mm -hmm. last very long so it was hard to do I mean like it was there there aren't a lot remaining, so I kind of wanted to get rid of the people just so I could look at the stuff. That's awesome. Um, what are we, in this case, what are we looking at? It's a tree stump. Um, I feel like it's from like Altoona, Pennsylvania or something like that, I think. And um, there is just a woman standing behind a tree stump. <laughs> like she probably wanted to be associated with like you know romantic nature Mm -hmm. or you know something like that there are a lot of tree stumps and fake rocks and stuff like that in the history (laughs) of photography um so the next one um it's like a little pedestal i'm really obsessed with all the the props that were used at the time Mm -hmm. like very few exist anymore especially the chairs that they used I just love them, and if you have one, if you are watching this, I want it. Um, (laughs) So call me. Uh, The next one is a fake rock. Um, I really like this rock. Um, (laughs) But, like, it's fun. I I just love how 
on the side, you know, there's a, a architectural element that might be look like it would be in a nice house and there's like a tile painted tile floor and maybe some kind of patio and but there's a rock <laughs> there and also some trees so it's kind of like all these different kind of fantasy elements are brought together and it's kind of like an early form of virtual reality yeah, in some ways totally so um the next one is um, were one where a lot of mistakes were included, and I was wondering, like, there's a man standing there, but it's like there's, like, another mm. backdrop falling down from the ceiling, and I don't know why they didn't just pull the chair over. This one's kind of, like, where the artificial environment really breaks down and is not that nice. I don't know why they didn't make it nicer for mm. him, but I think it's very funny. That <laughs> it's all messy like that, and they took the picture. Like, what was he going for then? Not the natural romanticized. He wasn't uh, the photographer, was he? No, no, they're just people. Like, they're just <laughs> like what I do, I yeah. Set up backgrounds. I mean, <laughs> yeah, there were a lot of background painters and like a lot of people just in the studio prop industry. But mm -hmm. this one's, I think, this one's a fail. I haven't really seen any of these uh, turn of the century stills like this, but just thinking about how this led into the big studio system where you have like the 300 foot tall ones of these that they roll in on casters, you know. Backgrounds? Mm hmm. Or Back like the ones you do for your school photos. The lasers. Mm hmm. Yeah, this is, this is really amazing, yeah. So. And I, I love that there's this, uh, to me, it's like a sense of history, digging the history, but removing the people brings it, again, it's like the earlier stuff that you were sharing with us where yeah. you're characterizing the environment. And, and so removing the people, I don't have that sense of, oh, this is the people back then, you know, that we, I can look into their face. Yeah. Instead, it puts me there and, and it makes me feel like with the environment. Like, I, I, I like your rock. <laughs> the strangely, it looks like a podium rock. Yeah. And everything is, um, everything is a planned background in some way. Like in the schools, they were a background that somebody put together. Mm -hmm. And in these, mm -hmm. they were something that they specifically were thinking of. This is the background of a picture. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, it would be a big deal because it would be a big portion of your paycheck. And, you know, you would maybe be, sometimes they would even share dresses or something. Mm -hmm. And so it was a big deal to have your photo taken. And, you know, all these things were very carefully considered. And um, so what's the next series that we're going to go into here? This is some newer stuff or? Yeah. So this is like the first day I'm showing anyone this new work. It's oh, great. This is the premiere? Yeah. So I put it on Facebook today because I want to tell people I was going to be on your show. But there are these dioramas I'm building. So I really liked doing, really you know, I really liked making that period room that was the researcher's office. But I can't, I couldn't keep doing that working at that scale. So um, I started creating these dioramas that are um, all made from images I collect on online archives where things are in the public domain. And I collect them all and then I, I colorize them and I cut them out and I create these rooms. Wow. And I just, it's just like really stream of consciousness like the way I assemble them, like this is a cave, so it's not quite a room, but I kind of keeping them in these boxes. They're like 16 by 20 inch boxes. And I, you know, I colorize the engravings in Photoshop and then I print them out. A lot of it's really influenced by like Daguerre, who's one of the inventors of photography and kind of credited with the invention of photography. And he was a, um, he created dioramas before. And he was also a great set designer. And his sets were so amazing that people would go to the shows just to see his sets where he would change things. She would change it from night to day. He would bring in a hurricane and then the calm after the storm. You would go inside of it and it would be surrounding you. And many of them burned down. And, Whoa. you know, part of the reason why he wanted to, I mean, he wanted to in, invent photography. There's many reasons because that would be like amazing to do that, you know, to fix images. But, you know, most of his work would burn down. And he was really interested in like controlling nature, like controlling the weather, 
like controlling these things through technology, which was really cutting edge and about like energy. Like you look at a daguerreotype and you just think, man, that's like old, you know, it's old out of date technology to us. And it seems just really ancient, but it was like incredible at the time. And also it was like, it was so beautiful. It was grainless and it recorded things like in the level of detail that we still haven't been able to rival really? with like digital technology. So it was like, like, like shocking. And I, I really like love these old archives with engravings because it's kind of like people's interpretations. Like how did people like exper experience the past through like these old dictionaries um, you know, like these old kind of like image archives where people would learn about what things are like overseas or, mm -hmm. you know, what things are like with these big encyclopedias of like natural history and stuff. They had to experience it through these like kind of like strange drawings, which they probably didn't connect to in the same way. And when I look at them, I feel like kind of like this weird, bizarre disconnect because a lot of times you, these days you look at images like in these huge groupings where you kind of like don't focus on like a single um image but you kind of oops oh sorry look, sorry little technical difficulties there. I'm, I'm sorry can you go on so i i just you know i i decided to, to create these diorama boxes and uh, I just am having fun with them, kind of building them and doing something that's not like on the, it's a lot of it's, you know, the planning and the colorization and the looking for the images is done on the computer, but then building them is something kind of refreshing. Right, the craftsmanship yeah. behind it. I, I'm really uh, impressed with these two. These are really amazing. In some way, this seems to me like the opposite of what you're doing with the other backdrops where you're finding, you're recreating it and adding your own little subjects in these versus like um, using the actual old one or removing the subject. But these seem really complex. These take you a long time to build? Yes. Um, I only was able to build four in one year. <laughs> because, <Wow. laughs> but I'm going to spend more time on them. It just, it takes a long time because a lot of it's like the learning curve of, of building them mm -hmm. and like cutting everything out and making it the way I want. I want to make them more like complex i'm really i really love the old toy theaters and mm -hmm. you know kind of those old forms of entertainment and like i like um my biggest influences are actually like it my biggest influence is like really cinema like i don't really look at other photographers for any of these projects mm -hmm. um but i look at more at like maybe like max like or or kind of like surrealist artists like Max Ernst or something like that. I'll I'll look at that mm -hmm. more and combine that with like cinema as my influence and kind of create the stage sets that way. I don't know if that makes any sense, but yeah, they're they're really beautiful. And that. we're about to see an image of um, not the actual presentation image, but just showing the behind the scenes, right? Yeah. And uh, the. Looking at the top of this image and stuff, it looks again. It looks so complex. Using LED lights behind there and and or something. Or can I ask yeah. about your technique about oh, yeah. how you light it up and stuff? So this one, I would just, I just have different, you know, industrial lamps like utility lamps, and I do a long exposure and I run around and I light it by flashlight with the different colored cool. lights. Awesome. But I like the blue room. I did make a little LED light and lit up the li the lamp on the. Um, on the table oh, that one with a there. little light, the blue one. But you can kind of see all the, my my cheap party lights and stuff I light them with <laughs> in this picture. And have you ever presented these where people can, like, I mean, these are brand new, right? So this yeah, is the first no, time anybody's seen these. This is the first. I mean, I wow. showed some friends. Um, Do you plan something that where we could go up to them and look into them? And, like, will there be a, a show or something? No, there's not going to be a show. I'm just going to I'm just kind of like keeping it to myself <laughs> for now. Mm -hmm. Maybe there'll be a show someday. But mostly like I think that I've made some large prints from them. So right now they're prints, but you could come over to my apartment and see them in so person. The, the print of the picture of the scene. Yeah, so mm, everything cool. that you've been seeing is kind of like my final image mm -hmm. of them. And there's so many layers to it that at the end of the day 
I imagine it would be like, what am I actually looking at here? It'd be intriguing just to find out the process of what you're looking at. Yeah, very cool. I love those. That's really amazing. Thank what's you. the? Are they all the the same size? Um, what's the largest that you've worked doing this kind of thing? They're all like between like twenty inches and fourteen inches. They're all basically the same size. Mm -hmm. Do you have any plans to build any sets in the future? Is that would you like to you get know, into that? I or? would like to um, use the vinyl. You know how you could print out large vinyl images. Mm -hmm. I would love to create like a space that you could walk into, like a large diorama, maybe somewhat similar to Daguerre, or maybe even use these as like the basis for sets for like a short film or something awesome. like that, where the cutouts of the furniture and stuff would be like large cardboard cutouts. Mm -hmm. Like I would like that awesome. at some point, someday. Cool. I can see it, yeah. So um, is, uh, can you give us your website? Like where can we go check out, some, maybe not this stuff, but some stuff on your webpage, right? Yes, uh, it's just lissarivera.com, L-I-S-S-A, Rivera. Cool, lissarivera.com. We want everybody to go check that out. I'm, um, yeah, really shaken by your really, really cool stuff. My pleasure. Thank, Thank you, you for joining Thanks us, Lissa. Mike. Awesome. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. Yeah, lissarivera.com. Thank you, Lissa. Longer? It's what do you think about that, Mike? Episode 20, you know, episode, 20th episode. Uh, no, that, that really is in, inspired me. I love the idea of the craftsmanship that goes behind that. Like, mm -hmm. I can, I'm really into, you know, making stuff like that, too. And that just pictures were blown, blowing me away. Really yeah. great stuff. I especially like the uh, pictures of the insides of the schools and the fraternity houses and the, the institutional spaces mm -hmm. uh, with nobody in them. But, you know, just that idea of this this space which some people take seriously some people think about what's going to go into and some people don't but a lot of the time it's just a, a product of economic status or who you are or what's what's mm -hmm. available to you and there's uh, a lot of people who will just pass through that space and not ever look at it yeah it's like uh, being aware of your breathing or something and the yeah. historic element too like the history lesson that's um inherent in the work too is great so uh yeah really awesome um, we're going to go into our third segment now, and then uh, we're yeah. going to have a little improvised musical breakdown with everybody. Yeah. Um, but thank you guys all for joining us. Um, we have a recurring guest tonight with us, Emmanuel Iduma. And Emmanuel is a friend of the Sulphur Bath, and um, Emmanuel and Sean Randall, working together at The Mantle, mantlethought.org, uh, are recently publishing um, a book. So we would like to talk to them about that. So please welcome out Emmanuel. <laughs> Hi, Emmanuel. How are you doing, man? Hi, I'm fine. Yeah, Thank thanks you. for joining us again. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Um, you can pull so close to you if you like. So Sean asked me to there speak into the mic, so, yeah. Yeah. Well, we want to hear quite clearly what's going on. Yeah, so absolutely. Yeah. Um, so um, we, I had this interview with, I had a series of interviews with young writers from about five countries in Africa. Um, last year on the mantle mm -hmm. and we kind of it went really well it was kind of um, well received and so Sean said to me hey let's put this together in a book and we'll ask each of the writers for um, short stories you know like original short stories to accompany the interviews and so that was like the beginning of this this thing um, and so we decided to put together the book we asked for for original short stories from nine of the writers that we have featured um, and all of them gave us short stories and we a um, couple of months ago we concluded the editing of the um, stories and and yeah <laughs> so we are putting it together into a book and we because the mantle is you know you know what the mantle is I guess everybody who's been watching this show knows what the mantle is. It's a very progressive, you know, um, web journal. And Sean has always been interested in looking at um, global voices mm -hmm. in, in the mantle. And so he, um, the mantle is very interested in publishing, you know, younger African writers, and we call them new African writers, mm -hmm. just to play on the word new, you know. Mm. Um, and, and so that's, that's, that's what we are doing. Um, and because the mantle is not a big publishing firm, it's basically an independent publishing firm. We need to 
crowd finance this project. And mm-hmm. So we've been doing that for about um, 20 days now. So, and it's quite we've we've passed the 50%, you know, mark and we, <laughs> and it's it's doing quite well, really. That's um, excellent. Yeah. Yeah. It's and so how are you doing that? You're uh, mm. crowd financing. Are you just uh, talking different places and asking for help, or? Well, you guys are running a campaign. Actually. Yeah, we are running a campaign on Indiegogo. Indiegogo. Um, okay. I didn't mention that. Yeah. But yeah, um, we'll tell it. What's the actual web page for people to go check it out? Um, I d- I can't memorize it. I I I didn't memorize it, but it's um. So when you go to Indiegogo, just type in Gambits and gotcha. you probably, you see it. I mean, so that's uh, pretty. In, Indiegogo? Indiegogo. Um, yeah. and, dot the, com, yeah. and the project's and called Gambit. Gambit, and yeah. And it's Newer African Writers is the subtitle of the book. Yeah, that's, a, that's the title of the book, yeah. This is Gambit, really, yeah. really exciting for, for you, for Sean, for The Mantle, for everybody that follows and reads The Mantle. I think it's a great opportunity. And I think it's the perfect thing that um, that should be happening with The Mantle. It's, it's really exciting. Yeah. Um, do you know how long it will take... Um, to, to actually publish it and get it out? Um, so by our estimation, um, we are looking at, I mean, like early next year, really, mm-hmm. um, because we have to put things together, the publishing process. I mean, everything is complete. The, the, um, and we've really, you know, some really big writers have agreed to write a blog for us okay. so um that's that's also quite exciting so the publishing process is probably going to take um between um throughout december but i but i think by january february the book the actual book should be out that's great yeah and um just we're gonna continue talking about this of course but i just want to say we went over it saying oh they've got a campaign for indiegogo but here's the look into the camera to tell everybody like actually go there and help these guys publish this book this is uh, yeah. one of those campaigns that like everybody should be supporting. It doesn't take much, but go give a few bucks and help these guys publish this book. It's really going to be great. Um, and we're going to put on the archive all the information on the link for mm-hmm. how people can get there, too. Yeah. Um, so y- uh, you said there's nine stories, and how many writers? Um, nine writers. Nine writers. And mm-hmm. is it um, kind of spread out all over the continent, or is it... Um, so, I mean, I, I, was, I was hoping we'd get to this, because when, when I started the project, it was basically like I'm a young writer... Um, living in Nigeria and I know a lot of my friends who are also like very intelligent have an awareness of their crafts you know mm-hmm. and the kind of sensibility is the one they are work to embody you know um, and so I was kind of interested in having conversations with them so it turns out that if I'm talking about my friends the people I would know immediately are people who are based in Nigeria as well mm-hmm. um, and and so um, so most of the writers, like four of them are from Nigeria, and then you have people from, uh, someone from Zimbabwe, someone from Botswana, someone from Malawi, um, someone from, that's a country I'm missing, basically like five countries <laughs> on the continent, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, and, and so uh, what's, what, what we've been, what I've been thinking about is how this, this book is not necessarily like, um, a statement on this is African literature, as much as it is like um, a um, a gesture of what we what we, what we think um, African literature is getting into. Um, people who are based in their home countries, writers who are based in their home countries, don't need to travel out of the continent before they make um, a statement about their writing. You know, and and so this is more or less like a gesture um, of. Of what um, what we think uh, the next the next phase in African literature will be uh, more than anything else. That's great. That's a great yeah. gesture. Well said. Is Got a mic right there. In English? Yeah, it's yeah, it's completely in English. I mean, there's the there's the argument that um, English is now an African language. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. So I mean, let's not go into that. But yeah. <laughs> 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 and so you, last time you were on, you were talking us about the Africa Without Borders project, right? Invisible Borders. Yeah. Invisible Borders, yeah. right. And so um, this project is gearing up to start happening again, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's a completely different project. But um, so as you know, I mean, I've been involved in, with this photography organization that travels by road across Africa. One of the projects we do is a road trip. Um, and and so we, we are preparing for the the fourth edition mm-hmm. sorry the fifth ed- fifth edition <laughs> mm-hmm. um which is which is supposed to be from lagos in nigeria to sarajevo in bosnia mm-hmm. like pretty much um 
crazy. That's um, a long training. Yeah, that's that's like um, four to five months of the year. Um, wow. And um, so yeah, it's it's definitely a lot of work to be done in the preparation. Mm-hmm. And um, for us, it's also questioning what you know the what's what it means to first of all live in Africa now um, and how that is changing and, and you know the difficulties the exciting possibilities of you know being in the continent now mm-hmm. I mean there are all this stuff all these themes that that kind of trip um, evoke and yeah <laughs> Well, it's it's like an epic quest in so many ways yeah. that I can yeah. imagine at the end of it, it'll be rife with you know meaning and projects mm-hmm. and different artists. Um, I bring it up because I'm wondering, are any of the writers that are contributing to Gambit involved with that project at all? Or um, no, because I know that's a kind of a huge pool of artists. Yeah, right? um, no, mm-hmm. uh, I would definitely love to <laughs> have some of the writers get involved, um, but so far, it's basically just me. You know, that's. Mm-hmm. Like I've n- I've not thought about that, so I should give that <laughs> I should give that some thoughts. Um, Gambit is, you know, like for 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 the man who is like um, um, an in, like an inception, like a new mm-hmm. uh, starting pub- the publishing arm of the man But for me, it's like you know one off because I'm you it's know the ongoing quest. Yeah, it's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so know. also Gambit. When I saw um, I saw an image of it. Have you guys decided that that's what the book will look like? Have I already seen the cover? Yeah, I think yeah. so. It's great. I mean, I really, I yeah. Like yeah. Um, I mean, like, I mean, th- there'll probably be like a blob or something, just something really catchy, some few lines or something, few words, but that's basically it. And uh, how much longer is the Indiegogo um, campaign going to be running for? Um, uh, we have 24 days today mm-hmm. left. And how long has it been up so left? far? Uh, it's been, it's a 40 day campaign. So oh, okay. we have um, just about. So you're ahead of the curve, past 50%, but yeah. you still have more than half to go. That's great. Yeah. Um, That's really great. It'll happen for sure. I mean, it's in the cards. Yeah. Yeah. You guys uh, are working on some amazing stuff. And mm-hmm. um, Sean is definitely the same. Uh, I was going to ask um, is there a way I can get it? How do, how do I get my hands on Farad? I just know about yeah, it and on, I want to read it. So. Um, yeah, it's on Amazon. So okay, great. Yeah, I mean, cool. just I mean, someone still wrote to me that he just made an order. So mm-hmm. I, I guess it's <laughs> it's still there. Mm-hmm. And yeah. can and can we talk about? I know we mentioned it before on the last yeah. episode, but can I ask you a little bit more about that? Definitely, like Emmanuel, the writer, but outside of uh, Gambit. Yeah, definitely. So um, are you working on something now? Can you uh, give us a, a background of what Farad is again, real quick, and then? Um, so yeah, um, it's always a difficult question to answer because I. When I set out to write for art, it's you know like there were going to be um, several stories that were going to intersect. So mm-hmm. there are stories of, um, for instance, the first story in the in the book is the story of um, a woman or a lady who s- slept with the dictator and lost her mind literally um, because there was this uh, meet in Nigeria that when the then president died in 98 he basically died while sleeping with an indian prostitute so it was very fascinating to me because this was like one of the first like one of one of the most interesting myths while growing up you know mm-hmm. as a as a kid and so when i i wanted to explore that story more i wanted to just imagine what kind of woman would have slept with the dictator or with the um the military president and 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 so that's that's what the first chapter dealt with and then the second chapter dealt with like a um, one of the crises uh, one of the political unrest that happened in the central in central nigeria um and then the third chapter dealt with all this kind of this this crazy people who were doing who were just bizarre living bizarre lives and people were trying to figure out how what their lives meant um, um and then on and on you have stories of um um, stories of a a woman who wakes up one day and decides that her life she has to her life has to change like she's living so this is really like a r- different way of thinking about middle class Nigeria you know it's not the kind of stories well I mean that's what I started to realize after it w- came out um, and that's what people talked about that these are not the kind of stories that I would expect you know this is very middle class this is very um, intelligent characters and I'm like. Hey, why shouldn't we have intelligent characters? I know, you're like, what? You know, why is that worth mentioning? <laughs> because of, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so, I mean, it's pretty weird. I've 
had all kinds of stuff in relation to the book. Um, so the the um, the story that brings everything together is that all the major characters now participate in. Um, so I, I kind of set it in a university chapel because I grew up in the university campus and I felt that um, one of the most central um, like meeting points um, was this chapel where I mean, or I mean this chapel that. For instance, you had a choir master who <laughs> had been the choir master for 25 years. And I was wondering, why should you be the choir master for 25 years? And decided to make a story out of that. And this, all these characters now come together to, you know, play out that question of power and um, the politics involved in religion. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's kind of, of course, you see that it's, um, I, was, um, I mean, I was very eccentric. I don't know what I was doing, but... Um, <laughs> at the end of the day, it turns out that it's, you know. You're not going to do a spoiler right now, are you? Is it a, is it a spoiler if it's the actual author telling? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. It's still yeah, I'm but sorry, I mean, I'm, I'm, interrupt. <laughs> I'm, I don't know. I, you know, it's just fun because, um, like, uh, for me, the book was just something I was playing around with and someone, I had pop, I had people who were interested in publishing it, so why not? So yeah, let's let's do it. <laughs> and I've heard it called experimental. Do you consider it experimental, or do you feel feel that that's more kind of like other people placing this idea upon it that's not necessarily the case? Or, um, I mean, um, I don't know how to answer that. I, I, I mean, like because you know classifications are. I mean, like it's it's kind of. Um, easy to classify stuff and then when people find that they cannot classify something it becomes experimental mm -hmm. and i try to walk against that notion of you know writing an experimental story because it really doesn't mean anything yeah, um, yeah. for me the most important thing is to write a story that you feel drawn to no matter how bizarre it turns out to be you know and sometimes i i, I actually feel i'm writing something that is bizarre um, but that's the story that interests me you know yeah. I mean real so. life is bizarre. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Think so. about and to make it even more interesting, I had people who, I mean recently someone said to me that that she she read one of the stories and it was exactly the same situation that was happening in her life and I'm like, okay. <laughs> That's pretty scary. Um yeah. So it's so I don't I don't really think it's experimental. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe it's unusual, but not experimental. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I love how you say that. It's interesting to, to hear that perspective of it, about experimental and something to analyze itself about. What does that really mean? You know. Yeah. But um, yeah. So um, are you working on something else now too? Farad is before. You're, are yeah. you writing now? Or? I am. I mean, like um, being in graduate school is just quite intense. Um, so I'm kind of I'm working on something, and um, it's basically um, something around what you know like the the okay so i'll just tell you a basic premise that i'm working on um so so someone sees a photograph and um decides to lose his faith i mean he loses his faith instantly after looking at the photograph um so basically the, the what i'm working on now is a, a series of stories that basically question um the power of art and you know um mm -hmm. So yeah, that's mm. that's a central premise. So he sees uh, there's one visual image. Yeah, he sees, sees he goes to an exhibition and sees a photograph and just loses his faith. Mm. Just changes it changes everything. And um, I, I mean, like if if I'm, so, I, I've I've written the first part and I sent a couple of friends and someone sent me a very weird message and said to me, you know, like I think it's because you've moved to the U.S. that you write this kind of story. <laughs> What does that mean? Like he says, um, you know, I don't think any body in Nigeria would look at a photograph and lose his faith. I don't know too many people who are not religious in Nigeria, so I don't think it's a very Nigerian story. And I'm like, that's your experience. Like I know a lot of Nigerians who are not <laughs> religious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I'm very, I'm very interested in how that kind of that form of um, how art is um, this thing that jilts people which is one of the things that came up in the with the last guest mm -hmm. um you know you, you talked about how it's arresting and, and i kept thinking about how when art is taken from you know the when it's in the public place it becomes an intimate affair at, at the same time mm -hmm. so this is kind of um 
this this is then again I'm sure I'm sure it will be considered why are you thinking of this kind of story but this is what's just interesting to me right mm -hmm. now maybe because I'm studying um criticism or something you know mm -hmm. um, well and also bringing up the idea that other people will look upon or it has happened that are looking upon you as though you are a voice of Nigeria and yeah. not just an author Emmanuel Iduma yeah and can I ask a little bit about that about how yeah. you feel I mean that's also related to Gambit yeah um I mean I, I think okay so this is a few months ago what I've said I don't want to take on any responsibility but now um the more I think about it the more I feel, you know, the more I feel that such forms of um, responsibility is necessary. Um, I've been thinking a lot about social engagement and, um, for instance, how you can be an artist and yet be um, a co like a community organizer and how you can speak to um, the politics of your time in the, in the very raw sense of the word, politics. I mean... Um, in a country like Nigeria, there's a lot of, there's a lot of involvement, I mean, in everywhere, basically. There's a lot of involvement that is possible um, as an artist and yet being involved in politics. And so in that sense, I feel very much that, yeah, I mean, I, Nigeria is, is, um, is home to me because this is, like, this is the country that has framed my understanding of myself and my identity. And so, in some way, I must feel a level of um, responsibility to it. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think I'm not, I'm not interested in what um, people think about as my, I mean, as what my responsibility is, as I'm interested in what I feel my responsibility, my own yeah, um, right. understanding of my, my responsibility, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Um, so, yeah, that's... And it's, it's inspiring it. to hear you speak about it so clearly defined. Um, um that's that's like the iteration today i mean tomorrow it might but yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah i mean like i i feel i free, feel that at some point you have to define these things and yeah because like the older african writers i mean you 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 get a lot of inspiration from people like wale shenka people who basically uh, we're not merely writers they were committed and i've been thinking about what that co kind of commitment would, would mean today um what you know what kind of str what strategies of resistance for instance or activism would adopt um because we, we we really have to speak about our country i feel um as a nigerian i really have to be involved in um not necessarily like changing whatever but shaping the dialogue you know so how can I how can I do that now when Facebook is the scene of mass protest? Mm -hmm. You know, um, how can I sidestep all of that, or Twitter or whatever, mm -hmm. and move into real engagement with um, um, my my country? Um, yeah, so that's that's what I've been thinking about a lot this past few weeks. Man. Yeah, that's that's very deep stuff, man. And I take it as inspiration. <laughs> I do yeah. like sitting here where I'm sitting and where I'm from. And <laughs> very cool, man. Um, yeah. yeah. So shout out to the mantle to Sean. Yeah, to Gambit. And Please to donate Gambit. to Gambit. Yeah, we want everybody to go check out the Indiegogo, yeah. can, and they can just go to Indiegogo.com and search Gambit. Yeah. Um, I mean, writers. I we could we could send you the link so that you put it um yeah so that you put it up yeah we'll have it on the archive but mm. for the people that are watching us now yeah. i want them to go right now yeah um yeah. 10 bucks 20 bucks yeah 100 bucks. give what you can seriously like we give to so many <laughs> different things and i i went and ate a hamburger the other day and i had this gigantic fries i couldn't finish <laughs> 10 bucks i just should have given that to the gambit you know? yeah fries. but we'll be on there i saw i saw uh <laughs> it was a value meals a bunch of really good fries um I hope. But yeah, I saw uh, Sean's also been like forwarding whenever somebody contributes. Yeah. So there's a, sh a shout out and a thank you. Yeah, and, uh, and a big one. I mean, I'll probably not mention his name, but one of um, Africa's really big artists just sent us a um, good amount of money. So, Great. Um, Excellent. <laughs> yeah, so I think it's really exciting. It's really touching. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's great. So there's su support behind it. We're all totally intrigued and, you yeah. know. Let us know. Once it's actually released, please, you and Sean, come back on with maybe some of the writers if we yeah. can get them into New York. Yeah. You know? or if, yeah. Um, um, yeah, there's some of them that are around now, so mm -hmm. it's possible. 
<laughs> awesome. All right. Yeah. Gambit is the name of the book. Newer African Writers. Yeah, New African Writing. Writing. Yeah. And that's uh, on Indiegogo. So check yeah. out Gambit Indiegogo and also go to uh, The Mantle and check out The Mantle, mantlethought.org. Yeah. Um, and Emmanuel, thank you so much thank man, you. for being with us. Thank you. Thanks for the lesson. Learning. Thank you. This was a really, really cool one, man. That's awesome, man. We uh, yeah. Again, I feel like we covered the gamut. We had the literary segment, we had the visual art, and we had yeah, music. This, this show has outdone itself. I don't take any responsibility for it. Mm -hmm. The show itself has outdone itself. <laughs> outdone itself. It's just been great. 20. Episode 20. So, um, I don't think... No, no outroduction needed, right? No, I don't have any. Uh, <laughs> start I don't have any uh, statements to tie it all together yeah, or anything right. like that. If it's that's what you're it, they, for. these guys just tied a, us all together yeah. themselves. Just let it float off into the ether. Yeah. So you got any ether? <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, thank you guys so much. All the guests tonight were really great. We're gonna do our little improvised jam now, episode yeah. twenty. Uh, I do so much. I want to thank Emmanuel Edema for joining us. I want to thank Scott Rudd for joining us and Lisa Rivera. And everybody, check out when you see the archive, check out the links that are attached here. And um, yeah, give to the book, check out the art, listen to the music. And thank you guys for joining us. We're going to play a little bit right now. All right. Thanks thank you very much. Me. Episode 20. <laughs> I grow just another rose out of concrete trying to stick to a beat trying to move my feet another sheet to the wind I'm trying to be a special blend of everything my mother taught me and everything the world has showed me
been the beginning, the end, and everything in between. I'm trying to learn how to just live out my dream. Because everything is about schemes, plots. They don't want us to live nice. <laughs> they don't want us following advice. <laughs> they don't want us living our life. They want us thinking twice instead of once. And they're doing what feels good. I rep a real one. Talking about Brooklyn. Talking about Bushman. Talking about inside you. Nobody trying to play me, I'm just kind of echelon, hella gone, everything I do belongs.
episode 20.